So we begin um, in England, in England, at a particular cathedral in England, Ely Cathedral, Ely Cathedral, and here's a picture of it. Begun in 672 AD, the cathedral itself was built in 1083. What's interesting about Ely Cathedral is that there is a marble memorial, a, a, a piece of stone in front of the main altar that basically says for 1600 years, for 1600 years, and it was put in a few years ago, so it's been a little bit longer than that, but for 1600 years, Christians have gathered to worship in this space. Now, if you go to this cathedral and you see that placard, you see that marble memorial right there, you take a step back, perhaps, and you think, I'm standing in a place where for 1,600 years, 1,600 years, people have been worshiping God in this space. That's a powerful moment. That's a powerful recognition. Because with that recognition of 1,600 years, uh, basically, that is what the numinous is. That numinous is that encounter that basically in this space, one's whole self, one's body, one's mind, one's heart is caught up, can be caught up in the experience of the divine, in the experience of God. And for 1,600 years, in this cathedral, this plaque is set out to remind people that this is a place in which Millions, perhaps, of people have encountered God, and now you are joining them. You are becoming a part of that experience. So that says to us something about space and what space can do, what space can mean. It get to have that idea that in this location, in this cathedral, um, I am not the only one who is affected by this space. I'm not the only one who's affected by what happens here. Helps us to consider... Again, what is a church building? You know, what really is a church building? Is it a place, you know, that's, that's just functional? Does it just serve so that we can have a place to sit, to stand, to kneel in when we go to Mass, when we attend Mass? Or is there something more to the space? So the church building itself, though, is not just any space. There is an intention, there is a decision, there is a desire to arrange it so that something can happen so that something can occur in it. So we call it ordered symbolic space. You tie together the understandings of sacred space and holy ground. Because it's not just a space that's removed from the rest of the world. It's, this is not supposed to be um, just a sacred space, uh, a place in which there can, God can only be encountered here, God can only be found here. But basically it shows that in the same way you can have in your homes four walls, a roof, a floor, so too God uses those very things, four walls, a roof, a floor, so that people can be able to encounter who and what God is. That God uses time and space. God uses the things that we use so that we can exist and we can live our lives in the same way so that we can come to understand and know who God is and what God is asks of us who worship him. So we always want to make sure that we don't say that this is the only place to encounter God. So that brings in, that, that brings up the idea then of what does it mean to be holy? If this is a holy space, if the church is holy ground, how do we understand that? And there have been two different ways over history, over time, that people have come to understand what it means for us to gather in a holy space as believers, as Christians. So the first one, again, is before the Second Vatican Council. So before Vatican II, we call it the preconciliar, the council being Vatican II, a preconciliar understanding had a lot to do with um, uh, a, a Jewish understanding of sacred space, of sacred ground. In Hebrew, the word kadash, kadash means holy, means holy. In Hebrew, kadash means holy, and it means, though, something that is set apart, that is separate, and that is put together in a certain way. It was not often thought of, though, as something in opposition to the profane. So, so the profane is that which is not holy. So, as opposed, so a church as opposed to a bar. The, uh, a place where you go out to drink. Um, so it, it was not, Kadesh does not necessarily mean that this place is better than some other kind of place. It's just a place that is set apart 
for something different and unique to happen in it. The idea of the relationship between the sacred and the profane, the sacred and the not sacred, is not about a division, a dichotomy. It's not about dividing that this place is only where God is and other places are with, where God is not. Because that becomes problematic. That means that God is not powerful. That that means God is not almighty not to be everywhere. So we're not looking at difference, but we're looking at gradation. We're looking at different purposes and use. The idea of something unique happens in every space that we occupy as human beings. This, this space being the most profound, the most powerful of anything that we could ever experience as human beings. And so we see this in a number of key building structures that, that we have experienced in our history as, as Catholic Christians. So the first was a house church. Christianity begins not in large churches, but in the homes of people who said that they believed. The homes of people that said that they believed. And there was the sense, basically, of a group of believers gathered to be able to worship God and understand what it was, again, that God asked of them, wanted of them to do in the world. A second movement, then, led to what was known as the Basilica, Greek, for basically the hall of the king, uh, the, again, the hall of the emperor. Um, and that structure begins to take place of the house church once Christianity becomes the religion of the empire, once it gains imperial status. And so the sense in which now the basilica has to be able to house, be able to contain not just small groups that could sit in house, in, in house churches, but now it begins to uh, be able to accommodate um, a lot of people. And a lot of people who are now going to gather together to celebrate more publicly, as opposed to in private or in secret in the house churches, now more publicly the, the rites and the rituals of the church. The third structure that arises um, is basically the domed structures. You, and you begin to see that towards the Renaissance period in uh, European history. But the idea of the dome structure was not just to have a fancy roof on top of the space where Christians gathered, but it was the idea that in a sort of square, um, a, a, a square arrangement of a building, four walls, a roof, and a house, you place the dome on top of it to put inside of it the idea of what was the most perfect of shapes, the circle, which represented harmony, represented union, represented the ability of God to, to, to keep moving in, in life and in history. And so the sense in which, again, this, the, the visible and the invisible are, are tied together. Um, and the sense in which in the dome structure that what was done in heaven, the worship, the, the prayer, the praise of God in heaven, now could be also imitated here on earth. So each of these places are holy, but they're very different, basically, in the interaction that, ex that is done in them between the human and the divine, between humanity and God. But each of them represents, in their, your, their own unique way, the invisible presence of God in our midst. Again, a lot of different structures, homes, workplaces, banks, grocery stores, they're all spaces, they're all structures in our lives. But here, in a place called the church, is where we have that greatest experience of God in our midst. So just to take a look at the idea of the dome, and the idea of the dome structure and the circle within it. This is the Pantheon, um, a, a, a building in Rome, if you've ever gone to Rome or will ever get to Rome. It was the place that held um, uh, shrines of all the Roman gods. And then Christianity took it over, and it now is the Church of St. Mary and the Martyrs. But it was built in a way to show that perfection, the circle as perfection, within the building itself. A, a touching of heaven and earth together. So that was the uh, prior to Vatican II, the preconciliar understanding. What Vatican II, though, gives us is something that's a little bit even more enriching. The, again, the, the, the power of the holy, the space as being uh, a way for us to come into contact with God and for God to be able to interact with us um, is, is now deepened um, with the uh, understanding of what it means to be church after Vatican II. So what, after Vatican II, what is understood as church is basically the understanding that people deliberately, purposefully, place themselves before God, 
in, in gathering with other human beings among whom Christ has promised to dwell. The sense in which it is us gathering together that is very important and in some ways more important than the building itself. The building itself, the place, becomes secondary to what happens inside of it after Vatican II. So the space itself is made holy because of what happens there. In the non-Christian understanding of space, a space was holy because it was thought that a god or a goddess dwelt there. And so you went to visit them at their temple, at their shrine. But the Christian understanding of sacred space, very different. It's made holy because we baptize, we celebrate the mass, we celebrate marriages, we celebrate funerals, we celebrate the sacrament of the sick, the sacrament of penance. What happens in these sacred spaces makes the space sacred. So what you see in the post-Vatican II, in the understanding of church and church building after Vatican II, is that it expresses the fact that we are pilgrims. We are on a journey, always on a journey. There are little songs about being pilgrims on a journey. Um, but that's what we are. We are not comfortable fully here in living this existence. Our life is meant to be lived here and in heaven. So the sense in which what happens in this space is supposed to lead us to that glory that is heaven. But we do not reject this place, this earth on which we live, in which we live, on which we live, because God said that it was good. And nothing has ever taken away those words of God that said what I created was good. And so we use things that only the earth can experience. So we move from word to font, uh, which is usually at the entrance, well, actually over here, over here this time, word to font to table. We, we move from being able to speak, which is a very human, this world experience. We don't know if there will be speaking in heaven. We use water, which we need to survive with, which, was, which cleanses us. Then to table, the place where we eat and where we drink. We use all of that goodness in this space to help us recognize our way to heaven, our way to God. Basically do, uh, in this space, when we celebrate the sacraments is that we imitate what happens at the Easter Vigil again and again and again. It, it happens once on Easter Eve in a very dramatic way, but really it is echoed. It's, it's, it's repeated. It's imitated every time that we gather for Mass, every time that we gather for worship, the centrality of the Easter Vigil and what happens at the Easter Vigil. Just what does it mean then you know, with this understanding that comes from Vatican II, what does it mean to be church? And so you throw up that uh, word, ecclesia, which is the Greek word uh, for church, the Greek word from church. But it's interesting that there is a double reference whenever we use that word church, both in Greek and, but especially in English, because church can refer to us as the body of Christ, we call ourselves a church. It can refer to Catholicism, you know, as a church or any of the other perhaps Christian denominations, the Protestant church, the, uh, the Catholic church, but it also refers to a building. It could also refer to a building. It's a very unique use of this word. So the original Greek word uh, doesn't have C's, it has K's in it. Um, and that's important because it's a compound word. It's a word made up of two other words. The first syllable, ek, basically is a preposition and it means out of or out from. The second part of the word from the verb, claro, means to call or to be called. So two words, ek and claro, come together to create the word ecclesia, which means an action an action of calling out of or calling out from. It's basically what God is doing to all of humanity. All of humanity is calling out to humanity saying, come, come be with me. Come be a part of the life that I live. Come see your lives transformed and changed by coming to share life with me. That's the power, you know, again, of these people who call ourselves church and the building in which we gather together. It's the place 
in which we're called out of where we happen to be separate to come together and experience God. So we, we are, 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 the best definition of us as, as, as believers, as Christians, are those who are called forth by God. Those who are called forth by God. But because, again, that's a very active, it's, um, it's a very active definition. It's a verbal definition. Church is not just a noun. So it's a kinetic place. A kinetic place. Uh, kinetics basically is a science that deals with relationships. It deals basically with movement, with movement in those relationships. Because that's what happens here. The idea when in the new church, the font is at the front doors of the church. Because you move through the font, into the body of the church itself, to hear the word of God, and then up to the altar to receive. To receive the body and blood of Christ. It's always movement. Standing, sitting, kneeling, processing around and around. That's all kinetics. It's all the science of movement. And it's a profound movement that happens here in this space. And just to, re just to repeat, again, um, this church, as the, or the building itself, as a place where people can deliberately, purposely place themselves before God with others, because God has said, wherever two or three are gathered, there I am. So it's to recognize the fact that it's not just individually that God works within us, but it's more importantly and especially how God works amongst all of us gathered together. So the understanding is, is that this place is always secondary to intention. Again, uh, just to repeat that again, to repeat that again. But what is supposed to happen here? So people gather together with a purpose, not just individually, but as a group. And so what is supposed to be accomplished here? Well, this is where you have this liturgical reading of liturgical space. Again, uh, how do we understand what happens here? So first, it's a space to meet together as a body of the church, as an ecclesial body. So the, the space functions for us to be together first and foremost. Now, there's a problem with that because... <laughs> Because, as we have here, um, the pews, uh, the seats, are all lined up so that sometimes this looks like theater. Uh, so you're all watching what's happening up here, but we may not be seeing each other enough. So it's important to remember, we are here for each other. In Europe, in the large cathedrals in Europe, there are no seats because everybody basically stood. And so if you stand in a cathedral in Europe, you can see everybody around you and all those other kinds of things, crazy like that. So, but this is the sense in which um, uh, we, we have to remember more, we have to make more effort to remember that we're here, first and foremost, to be with each other, to be together. The second purpose, the second function of a church space is basically a place where the faithful, where all of us who are believers are addressed by God. We are built up into the body of Christ because of what God says to us in this space. The third uh, purpose for uh, why a liturgical, why a church space exists is it is the place where the presence of God, the divine presence, is not just seen, is not just viewed, but it's encountered. There is a back and forth that happens between God and us in this space. So notice first, and f notice first and foremost, I guess, that what happens in the space is not for us to pray to God, but for God to basically to work on us, to talk to us. That's why we're here together. We may pray to God individually, a church, uh, the, 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 the understanding of the theology will, will, will say. But when we're here together, we're here together to be conscious of each other and then able to listen to a God who is constantly speaking to us, building us up, and to make relationship with us. So what makes this uh, space as a church even more profound is that it is liminal, another big word, liminal, a liminal space. Um, it, liminal is Greek for a doorway, a doorway. And when you pass through a doorway, you move from one space into another. Uh, when, you, when, you move, when you move through significant doorways, 
you can move from one way of looking at things or living into another way of looking at things and, and living. That's what happens when we enter a church building through its doorways. We are moving from the life that we may live on a day-to-day -day basis to now a life that is meant to be lived with God on a day-to-day -day basis, to experience it here and then take it back out into the life that we live, to move back and forth through these doorways. So again, it makes this experience, again, um, the, the idea of movement, how important the idea of movement is in, in, in a sacred space like a church. Uh, because again, we don't just come here, although we sit uh, most of the time that we are here, uh, we're not just here to sit. We're, we're here to be affected, impacted, um, transformed by what happens here, to then basically take it out into the world and to live it in our, in our daily lives. So the theology. You add to that, though, now a little bit of the history of the dedication of churches. So take a look at a little bit of the history, dedication of churches. And if you look at the early church, there's one interesting kind of thing that arises. And, and that has to go along with what this man, um, Munitius Felix, uh, he lived in the third century. Um, his name in English from Latin means happy little man. Uh, he was very short, I guess. Um, what he said when he was asked by some non-Christians, non-Christian Romans, why don't you Christians have temples? Why don't you have shrines? Why don't you have buildings where you can worship your God, Jesus? Munichius basically responds with, well, you all have temples, you know, things like that, where you kind of lock your God away. But we Christians, we're temples of Christ. You know, we're temples of the Holy Spirit. We, we don't need a building because we are meant to be Christ, to be the Holy Spirit in the world, to whomever we meet, whoever we encounter. So for ancient Christians, it would be considered blasphemous to say that human being, to, to say that God could be contained in a building that was built by human hands, which is again why we move away from the sense that this is the only place where God can be. If you want to find God, go to a church. That's not true of our ancient history. As you move through history, basically we realize that um, after the fourth century, Christianity becomes legal, it gains imperial status, becomes the religion of the Roman Empire, and you end up with a public Christianity. A public Christianity that needs an outward expression of this major transformation. And so buildings become needed. Again, this idea that Munichius had, that Felix had, of us just being the temple of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit, begins to pass away. And we need buildings. Why? Well, because the number of Christians increases dramatically after the fourth century. And because now Christianity is the new religion of the Roman Empire, well, it needs to show itself, you know, to be that symbolically as large and as involved, as, um, uh, as, as ceremonial, as was all, all kinds of other things in the Roman Empire. But it's always important to know that when Christians began to take over buildings, to use them as church buildings, as places of assembly for, the, for believers to gather to worship God, the act of taking possession of a church, of its dedication, was done simply through the Mass. Celebrating the Mass at an altar in a building that was now going to be a site for Christians to gather around was enough. It was very simple, very simple. And it was important to have the bishop, though, of the place preach at this Mass. After um, a couple of uh, centuries, though, things begin to change and dedication practices uh, begin to arise. In Rome, uh, so to be Roman Catholic means that we are tied to Rome. Really, before the 7th century, there were no rites for dedication. Basically, you just had the Mass, and that was enough. In the eastern part of Europe, in the uh, eastern Christian area, so uh, in the Greek church, in the Egyptian church, um, in the churches of the uh, Near East, in, in, um, uh, in, on the other side of the Mediterranean, there was more ceremonial. There was more ceremonial. The chief focus was always on the altar, though, the dedication of the altar, especially over the space, the church. And it was the chief focus because the, the um, practice arose 
of placing relics, the bones, clothing, what have you, of martyrs um, within the altar, under the altar, somewhere near the altar. There were more martyrs in the eastern part of the early church than the western part of the early church, so it was easier to find relics in the east than it was in the west. But after the uh, year 787, it becomes customary, it becomes a norm that all churches had to have relics placed within their altars when their altars were dedicated. So in the west, you get a little bit of sharing, of, of trading of ideas between the east and the west, particularly in Gaul, which is uh, today uh, Spain, or today France, and, and in Spain. Um, but these practices that come from the East are kind of mixed with some Jewish ideas about dedicating sacred space and some non-Christian ideas about dedicating sacred space. And so you get a dedication ritual in the West that is perhaps a little less Christian than it should have been. So what we have today in our dedication rite that we'll experience on Tuesday is basically something that comes uh, from French practices uh, from the end of the 13th century. So Vatican II, there was a reform of this 13th century rite, which had continued basically un un unchanged from the 13th century, from the 1200s up until 1967. Uh, so that's a long time to be doing this, to be doing a right in a particular way. It changes in 1977. We get a reform in 1977. Um, and this reform says a lot of different things about what people should take away from experiencing the right of dedication of a church. So the first thing that the right says, the reformed right says, is that um, there is a dignity to every church building. And every church building, you know, serves a particular function. And that function is to allow people to be addressed by God. But it's also important to remember that the church can exist without literal and physical walls. If there were no church buildings, we would still be church. But it's also important to remember, too, that Christ is the reason for our existence as Christians, as believers, as church. Yet it's important to know, again, that we as pilgrims, as pilgrims, as people journeying through this world, through, through our lives in this world, we cannot exist outside of the limits of time and space. We need to have buildings to live in. We need to have structures that shape who and what we are. Church building basically serves a symbolic purpose. It becomes the visible counterpart, the visible counterpart of the invisible house of God. In his letter to the Corinthians, the first letter to the Corinthians, St. Paul basically says that. You know, you are the building of Christ. You are Christ's presence in this world. Live as if you are that, no, not knowing that you are that presence of Christ in the world. So the dedication ritual desires to express that, desires to express that. So in the dedication of a church, Basically, three, again, three objectives, uh, three ideas uh, are expressed. The first is that the dedication of a church should be an occasion of joy. So, like, moving into any new house should be an occasion of joy. Sometimes it's a pain because there's so much to do when you move into a house. Um, but it's an occasion of joy. It's the completion of a work that required effort, sacrifice, and unending, unremitting toil sometimes. Second expression of dedication of a church, is that it's basically an opportunity for the local church, so the parish of St. Stephen, to see itself as the true temple of God, to renew its obligation to be built up, because it's the place where Christ, where God instructs us, to be built up as the church, and to increase its membership, to bring other people into the space so that they can understand and know who this God is that says, I want you into my, in, in my life. The third, re the third expression of the dedication is basically the building, that this church building is one of many buildings in the, in the city of Sanford, in the state of North Carolina, one of many other buildings that are all over the place, so that are all over this, all, all over this uh, place in which we live. So how are we asked then to reflect, to ponder on what makes this place different? What makes this building different? And what value does it have for service to the human family? How does it serve the human family in a unique way, true to its nature, 
True to what it is, it's a place where Christ, where God is encountered in a profound way. And so it's important to remember that what happened here, um, because of the nature of what church is and its role and its function, takes on a different kind of, of word, e even um, as, as it, in, in the ritual that, that will be used to, to dedicate the church. So these, these two Latin words, uh, consecrare and benedicere. Um, consecrare, to consecrate. Churches are consecrated, they are dedicated. They are not merely blessed. Not merely blessed. And why the difference? Aren't they, can't you use these words interchangeably? Not really, especially when it comes to the dedication of a church. Um, there's a difference in the degree of solemnity of prayers and rites, but more importantly in the function of these words. More importantly in the function of these words. A blessing is sometimes, many times, something that is private. You know, you ask, you know, for a blessing from a priest or whatever it is. People can ask blessings again and again and again from priests whenever they need them. Um, they can be temporary, you know, they can be repeated, um, but a consecration, a dedication cannot. When something is consecrated, when something is dedicated, it is permanent. It is irrevocable. You, 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 can't, you can't ever say this church was never consecrated. It was, and it is. It's like the rite of baptism. Once someone is baptized, they are claimed by God. They may no longer practice being a Catholic or a Christian, but they can't ever get away or get rid of that baptism. Same thing happens to a church. Once it is dedicated to God and for the use of the people of God, it is always supposed to be used and dedicated in that way.